Hey, y'all. So um, this week we're learning about energy. It's going to be a good topic. Potentially overwhelming, but good. Um, and so that's chapter four. Four, I think in your book and um, we're going to cover most of it there'll be a couple of things where we go a little bit light um, as usual I'm going to break up the um, lectures into somewhat more manageable chunks um, but there we are okay so um, let's jump into this so um, some of this is actually review because we talked quite a bit about um, energetic concepts when we were talking about ecology when we were talking about trophic structure right so remember all the stuff about um energy transfers and all of that okay so actually a, a good chunk of this is going to be um review okay um still something you need to know right it's worth talking about it's worth learning about okay but um but it'll be you know something that should sound fairly familiar um, we're going to get into the details a little bit more, though, about how cells transform energy. Okay, so last time it was kind of big picture how energy flows through ecosystems, and now it's going to be more sort of granular where we're looking at um, how um, cells use energy. Okay, all right, so the review portion. <laughs> um, oh, look we're back to the laws of thermodynamics again. Um, so just as a reminder, remember these are the two laws that um, have to do with how energy behaves, okay? So it's important to remember that energy can't be created nor destroyed, all right? So um, when I say that, what I want you to think about is a lot of times when we talk about energy being used, sounds like it's being used up but really it's more about it's being utilized to do something and it's never destroyed it never disappears it just changes form right so that's kind of what the first law of thermodynamics is leading us into and then the second law of thermodynamics deals with something called entropy I'm not super concerned that you have a very strong understanding of the term entropy. You can certainly read about it in your book because your book does talk about it a little bit. But the idea behind entropy is that nature, in nature, energy disperses spontaneously. We call that increase in disorder entropy. That's what it's called. OK, so, you know, the example that they always show in your book is like, oh, look, dirty dishes. Yeah, like, you know, the kitchen tends to get dirty if you don't constantly clean it. Yes, that is an example of entropy. It's kind of cheesy, but there it is. Right. So things have a tendency to become more and more disordered over time. That is that is the nature of the universe. OK. Um, and um, yeah. OK, and so what does this mean biologically? Well, why, why do we care? Like, what does that have to do with anything? Um, this is the fundamental reason why when we're talking about energy transformation, we're talking about um, losing energy as heat. Right. So recall, it's not destroyed. It just every time energy is transferred from one form to another. Some of that energy is lost in a non usable form that we call heat. Okay, and so that's why energy flows in one direction. Okay, so that should be review. That should be something that you're fairly comfortable with, hopefully. Um, and then there's a cute little picture in your book that, once again, your book is introducing it for the first time because they don't know that you know this already. Okay, but you know this already. Um, learning about potential energy and kinetic energy. So potential energy, remember, is energy uh, that is stored. Right. So it's the it's the potential to have movement. OK, so potential energy, kinetic energy is energy of motion. Right. And then one thing we kind of talked about last time, but I want to kind of, you know, reiterate now is the the idea that chemical energy is a type of potential energy. OK, so look at this diagram review this stuff you'll be good right more examples of potential and kinetic energy 
Okay. Um, this also is something that I had in the PowerPoint earlier um, when we were talking about how energy is transformed from one kind to another. This is an example of um, chemical energy, a type of potential energy being transformed into kinetic energy. And along the way, we're losing some of that energy to an unusable form that we call heat. Okay, vehicles do this, at least, you know, vehicles that are powered by some sort of fossil fuel, whether it be gasoline or natural gas or whatever, compressed natural gas, doesn't matter. They're burning something, right? So that process of changing that energy from one form to another is combustion, okay? Well, that's not how cells do it. <laughs> and it makes sense, why, right? Because combustion produces a lot of heat, um, because it's not very efficient, right? So imagine if your cells, the only way that they could change forms of energy is by like lighting on fire, right? That wouldn't, that wouldn't work, right? The reason it works in your car is because we can contain the fire, right? And we have um, mechanisms in place to keep your vehicle cool, right? To keep your engine cool. Yeah? Okay. Um, and if your engine overheats, guess what? Causes damage to the engine, right? So Combustion is not something that happens in living things as a way of transforming energy. The way that living things transform energy, there's actually a couple of different ways, but the way that they take stored energy and convert it into energy of motion, for example, right, kinetic energy is through a process called cellular respiration. So this chapter, the goal of this chapter is to do a couple of things. It's to sort of remind us about energy overall, right? And then we're going to be talking about um, these two sort of really big ways that cells transform energy from one type to another type. Okay. And one of them is cellular respiration. That's the second one we'll talk about. The first one we're going to talk about is photosynthesis. Okay. Um, so energy transformation, that is what we're learning about this week. Okay. Um, whoa, whoa. Okay. So what does this mean for, um, for living things? So if you are a producer, so maybe this is another thing that your book talks about, cause it assumes you don't know this already, but you do. Right. So if you're a producer, what does that mean? So that means you make notice the air quotes, look at me, air quotes, right. You make energy. Um, really all it means is that you're capturing energy and you're storing it, right? So you're capturing a, a form of energy, storing it as another form, storing it as chemical energy. That's what producers do, okay? What do consumers do? Consumers then take advantage of that chemical energy that was stored by a producer, right? Um, and convert it to other forms to, to use that energy for something, right? To do work with that energy. Okay, um, the unit of measure that we use for energy is calories. And so we did talk about this a little bit um, when we were talking about um, the trophic structure, the en energy pyramid, remember that? The whole like 90% is lost as heat, you know, that whole thing, right? Um, energy transfers are only 10% efficient, right? So calories with with a big c really means kilocalories and it's it's a unit of energy i don't i don't care if you know this but if you're curious um a calorie the 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 measurement of a calorie um is the amount of energy that is required to raise the temperature of one milliliter of water that's like a drop of water by one degree celsius Okay, so that's the definition of what a calorie is. Now, when we're talking about calories, when we're talking about food or exercise or any of those things, what we're actually talking about are kilocalories. Now, we have not spent time talking about the metric system because this is one of the things that I decided to let go um, with doing online learning, but kilo means a thousand. So when you see the word calorie written with a capital C instead of a lowercase c, right? Um, that means that five, that a hamburger <laughs> contains 557 calories, which is the amount of energy that it would take to raise the 
um, temperature of 557 milliliters of water. Actually, excuse me, no, 557 liters of water, because it's a thousand times that, right? By one degree. That's a lot of energy. Yeah, this is why you don't want to eat too many cheeseburgers. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so what they've shown you here is in your book talks more about this. I'm not going to get into the whole nutrition side too much. Um, but certainly if you're interested in this, and I know some of you are, some, some of you are interested in pursuing careers in nutrition or related fields, um, certainly read more about it. But um, your book has an example of a nutrition label and how to read the nutrition label. Um, and it talks about, you know, to kind of give you an equivalency, right? So if you're comparing, you know, these three examples of foods, a hamburger, a chocolate bar, and an orange, and then comparing how many calories of activity are equivalent to that. These, of course, are estimates. And so one important thing I want you to realize is that, um, yeah, not all hamburgers are 557 calories. Like if you get one of those like super scary ones that has like all the cheese and bacon and like all of the delicious things, it's going to be way more. <laughs> right and if you have like a turkey burger with no cheese right it's not going to be as much okay so and the whole chocolate bar thing too like no not all chocolate bars are 220 calories if you get one of those big ones you could be looking at you know 800 no problem okay um so those are just estimates and then the other thing is over here it shows the amount of calories that are burned um with walking right how much time you know, how much time do you have to walk to burn that cheeseburger, right? And it ends up being 2.2 <laughs> 2 hours. Um, that's a lot of walking. Um, that also varies depending on your body size, depending on your gender, depending on your, uh, not your gender, your sex, depending on your physical fitness, depending on where you're walking, at what altitude, is it steep, is it not, right? Are you being dragged by a dog? That's my experience with walking is it's like, you know, I end up walking really fast because <laughs> the puppies pull me. The puppies are turning one, by the way. Just so you know, their birthday is this weekend. So I'm thinking about them, even though they don't jump into the back of me during videos anymore because I'm inside um, and they're not allowed in here when I'm making videos. Um, anyway, so read some of that stuff, okay? So fundamentally, the, the source of energy that drives the engine of a consumer is the chemical energy in food, right? And so we tend, when we're talking about energy and we're talking about food energy, we tend to focus almost exclusively on glucose, which you will remember that glucose is a um, type of monosaccharide. Okay, um, we've even used glucose last week when we were doing our lab, at least for those of you that were able to do the lab, but we won't go into that right now, um, right? So glucose is, um, is, a, is a monosaccharide, it's a it's simple sugar. Um, and so we use that a lot when we're talking about um, how um, photosynthesis and cellular respiration work. But I want you to know that there are all kinds of other things that we can use for food energy as well. And so that's going to come back into play at the end of the chapter. Okay. So we spent a lot of time focusing on glucose, but that's not the only source of energy. Okay. For, for consumers like us. All right. Okay. So, sorry, I'm just kind of where am I? Okay. So we'll just, this video is going to be like an intro video and then we'll do a separate one for photosynthesis and a separate one for cellular respiration. That's what we're going to do. Okay. So ATP, the initials ATP stand for adenosine tri phosphate. Okay. Adenosine triphosphate is actually a nucleotide, right? So that might not sound familiar because we haven't talked about them much yet. But when we were talking about macromolecules, one of the classes that we talked about were nucleic acids. And we talked about how nucleic acids, the monomers are called nucleotides. And the two different types of nucleic acids that we talked about were DNA and RNA. Well, it turns out ATP is actually a nucleotide as well, which is interesting not important for what we're talking about, <laughs> but it's an interesting little, you know, tidbit, 
Okay. Um, the reason that it's, well, and so later on, perhaps you might notice when we get into sort of the nuts and bolts and learn more about DNA, you might notice that the mole the individual monomers, the nucleotides of, of DNA and RNA kind of look similar to ATP. So you might notice that you might not either way. It's okay. All right. Um, ATP is often described as the energetic currency of the cell, right? So consumers like us consume food, but we, we don't just like break apart the food into little chunks and have all the cells in your body use different like chunks of food directly, right? You process, you take that energy out of the food um, and convert it into this molecule ATP. Okay. Um, ATP's name, so adenosine triphosphate, this is the adenosine part. Okay. And these three things are the phosphates. The three little yellow balls represent the three phosphate groups. Okay. Um, the thing about ATP that's really cool is it is recyclable, right? So ATP is a high energy molecule. It stores a lot of energy, okay? Often when you look at ATP, it's represented as like a starburst, right? So see how it's like a starburst here? That's to show you this is a very high energy molecule, okay? And so ATP is very high energy. When you break off that third phosphate, when you break that bond between the second phosphate and the third phosphate, when you break that bond, energy is released that cells can use for all the different things that cells do. We'll look at some examples in a minute, okay? Well, if you break that off, now we have our separate phosphate that's all by itself, P. Sometimes you'll see sometimes that it's called PI. It, that means inorganic phosphate. Don't worry about that, but I'm just saying if you see it in some of the images and you're like, what's PI? It's a phosphate group, okay? And now since it's missing one of its P's, now what are we going to call this molecule? It was ATP. Now it's ADP, right? So remember ATP starbursts because it's high energy. ADP is very low energy. It's not used for energy, energetic currency, right? But the cool thing is it can be reloaded. Right. So that's what we're looking at in this image. OK, so here we're showing, look, high energy ATP. Woo! If you break off that third P. You're releasing energy, energy that the cell can do, can use to do all kinds of work. We'll look at a picture in a second. And then you end up with ADP in that phosphate by itself. Right. Which are both low energy, which is why you don't see that little starburst. OK. But the cool thing is that if you input energy into the system, you can essentially stick that phosphate back onto the ADP and have more ATP again. Where does that energy come from that is required to stick that phosphate back on? Well, if you're a consumer, it comes from breaking down food. Okay? So we'll get into the nitty gritty of this a tiny bit, not a ton, but, but a little bit more, okay? So what kinds of cellular work? What are we talking about? We're talking about cellular work. What are we talking about? Um, we can be talking about something as straightforward as movement, right? So this picture is not from your book. It's from a different book. And your picture doesn't show, your picture, your book doesn't show pictures like this one. And I think it's because they're trying not to, you know, this is sort of a confusing picture to look at. But what this is trying to show you is it's trying to show you that ATP is used mechanically. And when we talk about mechanical work, essentially what we're talking about is we're talking about movement. So this is an image that shows how muscle cells actually work. We're not going to get into the details of that. This is not that class. If you would like to talk about that, take anatomy and physiology. We're not going to go there. But, um, but right, ATP is used right? Basically the way that we described, right? The second phosphate, the second, the third phosphate is broken off of the ADP, yeah, in order to generate movement, in the process of generating movement, okay? Um, if you have a situation where you have a channel in a membrane, 
that re is needs to move something. Active transport, remember active transport? Okay, active transport requires energy. Well, ATP is used for that, right? So you crack off that phosphate, it allows the thing to happen and then you end up with ADP, okay? Um, ATP can be used to like force chemical reactions, right? ATP is used for all kinds of activities that require energy inside of a cell. So these are just some examples, okay? All right, um, the cool thing, Right, the I keep saying the cool thing. Like there's one cool thing. Um, so another, so you know, one of the cool things about ATP is that it is reusable and it can be used, reused hundreds of thousands of times. Right. So your cells are constantly recycling their ADP, converting it into ADP. ATP is converted into ADP when energy is removed. Right, is used, and then energy is used to reload the ADP to make ATP again. I said that kind of awkward, but I think you got it. Anyway, okay. So the only other thing I want to say in this video is like our way of introduction from energy is one of the really, I'm not super concerned that you understand the detailed chemical mechanism of all of these processes that we're going to learn about. Because when are you going to use that again as an average, you know, average Joe? right? As somebody who is not a scientist, when are you going to use that again? Never. <laughs> okay. What is important to me though, more is that you understand the relationship between these things because it helps you understand um, ecological issues. It helps you understand your own health and like understand the importance of the food that you eat. Um, that's why we're talking about this at all. Okay. So we're going to stay kind of big picture. All right. But one of the things that I do think is useful to, to keep in mind is the relationship between photosynthesis. Oh, man. I was getting all dramatic and like build up and then my pen doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> so the two processes are photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Those are the main things we're going to be talking about. Um, you recall that photosynthesis happens in which organelle? What kind of organelle is that? chloroplast, right? And cellular respiration occurs in mitochondria. That's right. Um, and so one really important thing to kind of realize about this process is that they are cyclical. These two processes are related, right? So photosynthesis harnesses energy from the sun. It also uses carbon dioxide and water. Those are the reactants. And the products are sugar, glucose specifically, but whatever, and oxygen. So those are the products of photosynthesis. The reactants of cellular respiration are sugar and oxygen. And the products are carbon dioxide and water and ATP. Okay. So there's the energy is flowing in one direction. We've talked about this, right? The energy is flowing in one direction, but the chemicals cycle. Yeah. Okay. So this should be something that you're kind of, you know, that you're, that you're keeping in your brain that you're, you're remembering. Okay. So I'm going to pause here. Well, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Right. Um, and so this is like the intro to energy video, I guess. And then we'll have one on photosynthesis and one on cellular respiration and something called fermentation as well. OK, and that's going to be the lab that we do this week is a fermentation lab. It's fun. I think it's fun. I think you'll think it's fun. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs>